Hey, I'm so glad you found us and that you're listening to and watching this sermon. What we want to do is to help you grow in your faith. And this series on Ephesians is intended to be used in conjunction with you and your home church. And if you don't have a home church, we would love for you to join Marco Church. You can find out more on our website here, marcochurch.com. We're also in this series learning how to love one another well. We want to love the Lord and we want to love one another well. That's exactly what we'll learn through the book of Ephesians. I pray that you're blessed as we bring hope to people with the truth of Jesus. is Brianna. If you could please open your Bibles to Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 24. It says, Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his fast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil, spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist the, in the evil day, and having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness and the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith in which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intersection for all the saints. Pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. Tychicus our dearly loved brother and faithful servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me so that you may be informed. I am sending him to you for this very reason, to let you know how we are and to encourage your hearts. Peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who have undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, good morning, Marco Church. How are we doing this morning? Well, it is good to be with you this morning. Uh, My name is Gary. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, I'm one of the pastors here at Marco, and it's my privilege to uh, open God's word with you this morning. So as you can tell, we've been in, we're in Ephesians this morning. We've been in this series um, called Love Well through the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesian church for the last uh, several weeks, and we've been calling this series Love Well. And we've found out, or hopefully we've found out, a number of things, but one of the main things we've been thinking about and talking about is that if we want to be a people who love well, it begins with us understanding how much we have been well-loved. And we're going to talk about that a lot in the coming weeks with our Advent series, but if we are going to be a people who love well in our churches, if you're going to love the people around you, if you're going to be able to love in your marriages, your spouse, your children, and even if you're going to be able to love those people around you, uh, as we learned last week, even your boss, you've got to understand the love that Jesus has for you. But the question that lingers a little bit with us this morning in this talk on uh, spiritual warfare or Christian warfare is where do you get the resources that you need to actually do that? Because it's one thing to tell you to to love well, but where do you actually get the resources and the help that you need to do that? Well, Paul's uh, answer this morning is found in Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to look at that together. But before we do that, uh, let me pray. If you pray with me, let's Our Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for what you have given to us and the treasure that is your word. Father, we pray that you would help us to see and understand your word clearly. Would you help us to understand your word so that we may not only um, know more about it, but that it may transform us. Jesus, we ask that you would help us to encounter you and all of your truth and your goodness and beauty. Holy Spirit, would you be present with us this morning? 
And Father, I pray that uh, you might help me in the words that I say not to be a barrier, uh, not even to be a hindrance in any way. May I decrease and may you increase that you alone may get the glory you deserve. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So it was April 29th, 2022, and it was a normal-ish, normal-ish eve in, uh, evening in Wichita, Kansas. That's where I served before I come into Marco. And my wife and I had the rare occasion to go out to dinner with a couple friend of ours to one of our favorite spots in town. And we uh, loved to go out with this couple, and we were getting ready to go out. We had heard throughout the day that there was some uh, dicey weather that was going to be potentially coming. Uh, But from all accounts, everything looked okay, and we thought we'll be able to go. We looked outside. The weather looked fine. The weathermen didn't think too much of it. So we decided to go ahead with our plans. We drop our kids off at their adopted grandparents' house. We get in the car. We go out to dinner. Uh, But as we're there and as the night begins to unfold, uh, the weather, the skies get a little bit darker. Uh, The weather starts looking a little dicier. And when, you know, you live in Kansas for almost seven years, you begin to kind of see things that are coming up and you're like, something's not right here. And we, even at one point, we thought it peculiar at the time, but we saw this couple outside the restaurant, and they were just like looking up in the sky like this, and we're thinking like, what is going on? And little did we know as we wrap up, say our goodbyes, pay our tab, that there was actually an EF3 tornado just a few miles east of us that, was, that had come down and had just traversed the landscape, changing the landscape and lives of people in Andover, Kansas. And if I could tell you what happened as a result, if I could tell you about the wreckage, if I could tell you about the fallout and all the things that transpired from it over the next several months and even still today, I would use one word, chaos. It's absolute, it was chaos. The word chaos is something that you and I are familiar with, whether it's a weather-related event, whether it's a disillusionment or a disappointment in your relationships or any number of things. I think all of us, believer, non-believer, we all know a little bit about what it means to have a life that is marked by disorder and chaos, don't we? Right? I think all of us know that. But here's the question I want you to ask this morning. Why? Why is it there? Looking at the church a little bit, even more specifically, uh, there are people who say that over the last 40 years, we've seen uh, one of the greatest migrations of the faithful leaving the church. We've talked about last week, Pastor Scott mentioned that within the church that there are marriages that have divorce rates that are languishing, sometimes equal to or higher than our culture. Why? Why the chaos? Why the confusion? Why the scandals, the abuse? Why all the brokenness that we see? Why? When we come to Ephesians 6 this morning and we arrive in this perhaps familiar section with many of you, one that many of you have known and you perhaps have read, and if you haven't, that's okay, but what Paul is going to say is that you and I have a common enemy. You have a common enemy, someone who is actively working against you, someone who is actively working against me, someone who is actively working against the mission of Jesus and the longing for what, of what Jesus wants for your life and for his church. And if you're to be a people who love well, if we're going to be a people who love well, it's going to mean that you and I actually have to fight for it. You actually have to fight for it. But if you're going to fight for it, there's three things you have to know before you even step in to the battle. You got to know who you're fighting, you got to know how to fight, and you got to know why you fight. So, who you're fighting, how you fight, and why you fight. And so looking at that question of who is it that you're fighting, as I was preparing this week, I was recounting this story, and I don't think that she's watching now, but uh, when I was in Wichita, I had the privilege... I'll call it that, of training uh, as a kickboxer. Uh, And I would go to the gym two or three times a week, and I I would make friends and make merry with some folks who enjoyed getting punched in the face and punching people in the face for a hobby. It was a strange bunch, and maybe I'm a little strange for being a part of that, but one of the things that we got to do that I loved was we got to spar with each other. And if you're unfamiliar with that language is we would take everything that we had learned in a given period of time and and we would get to practice that in real time with a real person who could respond. It's a lot different than like a punching bag. And I loved doing that because it not only helped me get better, but it also helped me to learn my mistakes. 
And as I went on, one of the things that I learned is that if I wanted an advantage and I didn't want to become a human punching bag for about 45 minutes, I had better learn the person who was across from me. Now, one of the people that I probably enjoyed sparring with the most was a woman named Kelsey, uh, the most unsuspecting. She was a hairdresser and a professional fighter. Uh, and Kelsey always seemed to like get into my guard, right? She always seemed to get past me no matter how much I would block, no matter how much I trained, no matter how much I knew her. And she always seemed to find a way to kick me in the head. And I stand up here today wishing I could tell you that I don't know what it's like to get beat up by a woman, but I do. And she did it a lot. Uh, but here's the thing. I tell you this story because the more I got to know Kelsey and the more I got to know her skill set, I'd like to believe that I was a little bit prepared, a little bit better prepared for what she would come at me with. I got to know who she was. Well, when you think about that in terms of spiritual warfare and who your enemy is, well, Paul tells us that you and I have this common enemy, and coming throughout this in this text, there's an enemy that is identified throughout the book of Ephesians as well uh, as the devil or as Satan himself. Chapter 2, a few weeks ago, we covered this, and he's called the prince of the power of the air or the prince of this world system. Here in the text that Brianna just read, we, we hear him simply called the devil. Who is the devil? Well, the devil is your adversary. He, he has an adverse or an adversarial relationship with you. If I could say it in more common languages, he doesn't like you. He doesn't like me. And he most certainly doesn't like Jesus and the church. In our broader culture, when we have these conversations around Satan, we often, I think, sanitize. We kind of make him palatable, make him less of a threat than perhaps what Paul would have him to do. He maybe looks a little bit like this guy that you see behind me in the screen. He's got this really weird, awkward jumpsuit. He's got this pitchfork. He doesn't look all that, he looks pretty unassuming and not really all that threatful, threatening, right? But is that really what Paul would have you to believe who he is? I'm not so sure. Well, who's he? Who is, who is your enemy? I was thinking about a book that got written in 1321. It was actually a poem that got written in 1321 that perhaps many of you have read. Uh, Dante's Inferno. Dante's Inferno is still a widely read uh, poem that gets read today, and it's a first-person account of the author Dante in his journey to hell. Now, I don't know why he would want to write that, but he write it, he did. Uh, and it's kind of lasted throughout uh, the literary ages. And in this poem, he, Dante writes, and as he descends further and further into hell, into what he calls the circles of hell, he comes into the lowest part, or the ninth circle, and there he comes face to face with the devil himself. And we think of Satan as the cartoon figure. Dante thinks of him a little bit more of like the guy on the right. But here's what Dante actually writes. He wept with all six eyes, and tears fell over his three chins mingled with bloody foam. The teeth of each of his mouth held a center kept as by a flax rake. Thus he held three of them in agony. It's kind of a far cry from the red devilish cartoon figure, isn't it? And I know it's a little bit vivid and perhaps maybe a little bit uncomfortable and off-putting, but church, I tell you this because if you and I don't know our enemy or if we neuter him or make him less of a threat than what he really is, you and I are a sitting duck or a defeated foe before you even step into battle. You don't have a chance. So you better know who he is. You better know what he's like. And perhaps Dante can help you learn that, but I will tell you that Paul and the Bible tell, is, is the best resource that you have to get to know who he is. You see, God's word, this book that we just read from and, and that we like to prioritize here tells you that Satan is among many things. He's a deceiver, he's a tempter, he's the father of lies, he's a prosecuting attorney against the children of God, he's the ruler of this world system, he's the one who comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, he's the one who comes to upend and disrupt the shalom that God has created for his world that you and I still long for but can't seem to find. He's all of those things. And he's working against you, and he's working against me, and he's working against the church. And so why does this matter? Why does it matter that you know all this? Well, Paul would go on to tell you in Ephesians chapter 6 this. He says that you and I 
are to fight. We're to fight against the schemes of the devil. We're to fight against uh, who he is, against rulers and authorities and cosmic powers and spiritual forces. Paul says our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against something more. And you see, friends, your fight is not against your spouse, it's not against your kids, it's not against your boss or your employer or your neighbor, it's not against uh, elected officials and organizations and political parties or any other number of things that often get your ire and your attention. Your battle, if Paul is true, if the word of God is true, is against Satan himself. That's who you're fighting is Satan himself. And to set your eyes and your targets and your energies elsewhere, frankly, is a battle that you'll never win, and it's a battle that's not worth your time. You and me, called by Jesus, are called to fight our common enemy in Satan himself. And so the question is, is how do you do that? If you and I are to learn not only who we are, but how we fight, well, then we have to have a little bit of a blueprint and a little bit of a strategy. About a year and a couple of months ago, I was the first time I walked into uh, Marco Presbyterian Church, and I come into the office, and there in my office uh, was a Nerf gun. It was a package of Nerf guns. And, and I asked myself, I didn't think anything of it at the time, but then I hear, you're going to need this. <laughs> and I'm going, okay. Uh, I'm asking myself a lot of questions like, why? Um, Why would I need this? Who else has one? Uh, And more importantly, like, what kind of culture did I just walk into that needs Nerf guns in a church office? But now, a year later, I've kind of learned a little bit. I've kind of figured out, okay, well, this is why I need Nerf guns in the church office here at Marco, in case you are wondering what we do Monday through Friday. But we're in a time of like high, te- high tension or high stress, maybe when we just need a break. Uh, someone in our office inevitably will take out the Nerf gun and they will begin a Nerf gun war. It's usually Scott. Uh, but we have these Nerf gun wars and when we do them, we use anything around us uh, to win because we want to have a strategy. We want to win. We want to fight. And I usually beat Scott, by the way. But imagine if I walk in on day one, or even this week, I'm probably going to get shot now this week, and I didn't have my gun. I was armorless, weaponless, defenseless. It probably wouldn't be a very good situation, would it? And yet, Paul says that you and I have weapons at our disposal that you and I have to know. And if we don't take and we don't put these things on, you and I might ourselves be in trouble. And so what does he say to us? What's his call to us? Verse 10 tells you this. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. In the ESV, it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. You see, Paul says, in this fight, he says to you here in verse 11, put on the full armor of God. And then again in verse 13, he says, take up the full armor of God. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. But notice what he says. Not some of it, not a little bit of it, not one piece of it or your preferred piece of it, all of it. Take up all the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand, so that you may be able to resist, so that you may be able to fight. But before he does any of that, look at what verse verse 10 tells you. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. We've been asking this question at least for a minute or so that how, how do you learn how to fight? More importantly, how do, you, how do you fight for the things that are near and dear to God's heart? How do you fight for the things that God wants you to fight for? Husbands, how do you fight in an effort to love your wife selflessly and sacrificially like Jesus did? How do you, parents, how do you love your kids when they're driving you nuts and you'd love nothing more than to find a way to give them away? How do you love your boss and your employees? How do you how do you love these people and create a workplace culture that helps people see and point to Jesus? How do you love a city or a town or a culture that wants nothing to do with you and actually is actively working against you? Well, Paul tells you, finally, be strengthened in the Lord 
and by his vast strength. You see, Paul's tense here, the, the, in the Greek, it's, it's actually in a, in a paradoxical tense called the passive imperative. It seems paradoxical. I say that because how can you be active and yet passive, right? He's like, don't do this, but do this. Do this, but don't do this. How do you do that? It occurs a couple places in Scripture, but it's, what he's trying to tell you is this. I'm telling you to be strong. I'm telling you to be engaged. I'm telling you to be strong in the Lord, but you're actually not the one who's acting first. You're not the primary actor, but rather the beneficiary and the recipient of it. So who's acting on your behalf? You might think of it this way, in a sense, that the first and primary actor in this the one who is leading the charge, the one who is strengthening you, the one who is actually fighting for you is God himself. Amen. And so what's your part in it? Well, I've heard, once recently heard a pastor say it this way. If you were to change uh, the way that it is written um, to help you understand what a passive imperative might look like, it says this. Allow yourself to be continually strengthened by the power that's already made available to you in your new position and relationship with Christ. It is the power that raised Christ from the dead and now dwells in you. Allow yourself to be strengthened. Be strengthened, fight, but allow yourself to, for God to be the one who is acting on your behalf. If you want to know how to fight, you have to continually come back to Jesus over and over and over again. He's the one who equips you. He's the one who's empowering you. He's the one who's enabling you to fight. And so what that means for you is that, church, as you keep coming back to Jesus, as Jack Miller once said, your life is going to have to be shaped so that you live as close as possible to Jesus as you can. To live as close to Jesus as you possibly can. But let's dig a little bit deeper because if you're familiar with this passage, you're thinking, okay, well, there's the particular weapons of armor and all of these things. And as you dive deeper into Paul's writing, again, we come back to this idea where he says, put on the whole armor of God and, and take up the whole armor of God. You and I's part is to engage. And when Paul writes this, he thinks about this Roman soldier that you see behind me up here, this guy that's covered from head to toe in his shield, that is covered from head to toe in his helmet and his sword. He's ready to go at a moment's notice. He's ready to fight at a moment's notice. And this is pretty much what Paul has in mind here with this call to take up the whole armor of God. But for a minute, let's step back and you may be able to say, Pastor, I, I got a lot going on in my life. I don't, I don't know that I can do that. I feel really weak. I feel sometimes like I can't even get out of bed. I can barely walk. I can barely fix my own food. I've got family issues and parent and kid issues. I've got all these things that are going on around me and, and you're telling me to, to take up, you're telling me to do something else and to do another thing. I, I don't even feel like I can see straight. That's okay. That's why I said at the very beginning, be strong in the Lord who's actually strengthening you. When you feel like you're weak and you feel like you can't do anything else, know that you have a God who is holding you and a God who is fighting for you. That's the beauty of a passage like this. But the normative experience is when you feel weak and you feel burdened and you feel like you can't even put one foot in front of the other and you have to lean into the grace of God or you have to lean into the body of Christ that's around you in the church, Paul still says that the normative experience for the Christian is that you are active and you are engaged, that you are, that you are standing firm, that you are getting dressed in the full armor of God and that you are, as James would later say, resisting your common enemy. And so Paul would go on later in this text and he would begin to give these pieces of armor, the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation and the feet that are shod with the gospel of peace. And, and we don't have time to unpack each and every one of those this morning, but I would encourage you uh, this week, today, go grab a good study Bible, right? If you want to know more, grab a cup of coffee. I'd love to talk to you more in detail. But, but here, here's what I want to point out. You see, every piece of armor that Paul mentions here 
whether it's the breastplate of righteousness, whether it's the helmet of salvation, whether it's the sword of the Spirit, you see, every piece that he mentions here is telling you a story about God. And one of the most important things it's telling you is it's painting a picture for you that you and I serve a God in his goodness who has not left you defenseless in the fight. I mean, you are in a fight, you are in a battle, and yet you are not left without the weapons and the resources you need to actually engage. God has not left your side. He has not left you defenseless. He is giving you exactly what you need when you need it for the purpose that you have. And to go a little bit step further, if we were to take and look back, even in places like the book of Isaiah, an Old Testament prophet, Isaiah 59, 17, tells us that the Lord himself in the midst of this, in the midst of when his people are suffering and they're in exile and they're, they're alone and they feel like God has rejected them, Isaiah says that actually the God who has sent them away in exile actually puts on the breastplate of righteousness himself. He puts on the helmet of salvation. He takes up the sword. Why? You see, because God in his goodness not only hasn't left you defenseless, but he himself is actually fighting the battle that you can't fight alone. You are called to participate in it. You are called to be a part of it. You are called to lean into it. But friends, this is not ultimately your fight. This is a fight that God himself is engaged in, God himself is active in, that you are a part of. But when you can't win, God can, and God has. And so why does that matter? Well, in the culture to which Paul speaks, we've talked about this a little bit, but if you're newer here, you're just coming back, the culture of Ephesus was a uh, culture that was very clearly full of what you and I might call the cultural rot. There were all kinds of things that were going on in this culture, uh, that whether it was worship at the temple of Diana, whether it was the sexual immorality, whether it was all kinds of things that we have talked about throughout this book, there were things that were going on in Ephesus that were, you might think, similar if not worse, and I said that, if not worse than what you and I see today. It was not a pleasant place. It was not a place that was worshiping Jesus. And yet, what does Paul tell you? What does Paul tell you in the midst of these things? He doesn't say pull away. He doesn't say pull back. He doesn't say yell, shout down, be afraid, get increasingly cynical. He doesn't say any of that. What does he say? Put on. Stand firm. Live faithfully. Be a light. Be a witness to the truth and the goodness of beauty of Jesus in a place and space where God has called you even if everyone around you thinks you look foolish. Show people Jesus in the way that you live, in the way that you speak. If you and I were to come back to this text again, he says if you want to know how to continue to do that, and Scott alluded to this a little bit earlier, but one of the, most, the greatest things you can do if you look down with me at verse 18 is to pray. Take up, put on, be engaged, be active, stand firm. All these little imperative commands, all these little things... The culture around me is falling apart. My world is falling apart. What do I do? You pray. Paul says, if you want to know how to stand firm, if you want to know how to fight, if you want to know how to stand out and be distinct in a culture that looks different than you, he says this in verse 18, pray at all times, sit in all prayer, with all perseverance for the saints. You see, because we do not wage war against flesh and blood, because your battle and my battle is not flesh and blood, but spiritual, Prayer is perhaps one of the, the greatest weapons that you have at your disposal. And, and it's actually one of the ones that you and I often admittedly feel probably the least comfortable with. Maybe we don't know how to pray. We're not comfortable praying. We, we, make, we make prayer seem like it's something we don't know how to do. And, but yet Paul says that prayer is the greatest weapon you have at your disposal in this fight. And it's to permeate your life. If you are a believer here in Jesus, Paul says that you are to pray without ceasing, that it is to permeate your life. And to pray, it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be eloquent. To pray is most basically to say this, God, I need you. We need you. I can't figure this out. I can't do this alone. I can't even do the task that you've called me to. I feel weak. I feel helpless. 
I know that's something that each and every one of us love to have come out of our mouths. But that's what he's saying. Prayer is you coming to God and saying, I need your help. Please help me. And then to believe that when you do that, he actually doesn't turn his back on you, but says, I know. I'm here. You see, our role, church, is to engage, to pray, to live, and to fight with his power and with his resources for Christ's sake. That's what this whole thing is about. This whole thing is not about winning. It's not about trying to achieve victory. It's, it's living from a place of victory because Christ has already won that victory for you and for me. And my last point that we want to ask is, why fight? Why should you and I fight? I mean, if you read the news headlines, if you look at what social commentators says, it, by, by human standards, the enemy seems to be gaining ground. The church seems to be becoming less and less and less influential in the world. Why not just resign and give in? It's easier. Why, why, why would you fight? We pick up our text in Ephesians 6, 19 through 20. And Paul ends a letter that is almost this reversal of roles, but it, it is common to his letters. And listen to what he says. Pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. Here's a man that's locked in a Roman prison with an inevitable death sentence. He's waiting to die, and yet he writes to this church, and he's praying. Uh, he's asking this church to pray for him and to say, I want you to pray for me that God would use me how, with however long I have left that I might point people to Jesus. There's got to be a confidence in him. There's got to be something in Paul that would make him write that. It's not, it's not just fluff. He's saying this, pray for me that I might point people to Jesus with however long I have left. And so if you were to invite Paul to be a conversation partner, if you were, to come, if you were sitting across from Paul and you were saying, Paul, why would you say that? Why do you fight? Paul, why should we fight? Why, why should the church fight? I think Paul might say this, we fight, you and I fight because Satan is defeated. We fight because Jesus is victorious. We fight because Jesus is better and the gospel is true. And we fight because our future is certain. We fight because Satan is defeated Jesus is victorious because Jesus is better and the gospel is true and because our future is certain. I think Paul might say something like that, probably more eloquently because he was way more intelligent than I am. But Paul wants you and me to understand that, friends, Jesus has secured a victory for you. How does Paul know that? And how can you know that? How can you have this kind of confidence that what, what we're saying here, that, that Jesus is actually victorious, how can you believe that that's true? It was March 30th, 1981, when John Hinckley Jr. took six bullets and fired them from a chamber in an attempt to assassinate then President Ronald Reagan. He wanted to assassinate him and end his life, and, and had he done that, had he been successful, it quite possibly would have changed uh, the landscape of our country in some pretty dramatic ways. And as those six shots left the chamber of that gun, had it not been for one man, it might have very well done that. But one man, Tim McCarthy, stepped in front of the president and took a bullet to his chest and saved the president's life. Right? Saved the president's life. Why? Was it for a paycheck? Was it out of love for a president? Yeah, perhaps. But perhaps one of the greatest things that it was, one of the greatest reasons and most compelling reasons was because this was Tim McCarthy's job. It was his mission. It was the thing that he had spent his entire adult life training for. He knew that what he had been called to do was to act as a detail and a, and a protection and a shield for this president. 
And when the time finally came for him to live into his call, for him to live into his job, for him to complete the task and fulfill the mission, he did it. He did it. You know, in like manner, if you were to go back all the way to the beginning, God the Father had a mission to create you and me and to create you and me that we might live for his glory. And he had a mission and he had a purpose and he knew that he had a real enemy in the devil himself who had tried not once, not twice, but hundreds of times to derail him. Satan had wanted nothing more than to see the mission of God up, up, upended, the kingdom of God defeated, and he tried and he tried and he tried. And God the Father was so committed to his mission, he was so committed to what he wanted to see happen, which is ultimately you and me coming to be in perfect relationship with him. He was so committed to that mission that he sent his son, Jesus. And Jesus comes and he lives not just a perfect life, but you see, friends, what, if the Bible tells us and if it's true and what Paul is telling you is that Jesus, like McCarthy, but in a greater manner, stepped in front of the bullet that you and I were, that was destined for you and I. It was a bullet of justice. It was a fiery dart that the, that the enemy had shot. It was a bullet of justice, and it was everything for you and me. It was your sin, your shame, my sin, my shame, and that of the entire world that Jesus stepped in front of and took into himself. And then he took it to Calvary and on the cross, and he defeated it by dying in our place and then coming out the other side. You and I would have been a crumpled heap under the weight of our sin and our shame but Christ stood in your place. He stepped in front of you and he took the bullet of justice and then he comes out the other side and do you know what he said? It is finished. It is finished. He looks death right in the face and says that it is finished and, and because this is true, because this is true, Satan was defeated at Calvary, at the cross. Jesus was victorious. The gospel is 100 and certainly true, 100% true, and it secured for you a future better than you could ever imagine today. And so you fight with his power, with his resources, for his sake, that the world might know that Christ is king and that Christ is better. You have been loved well so that you can love well. And that's how Christ loved you. And that's how you fight to show other people that Christ loves them. And so as we close this book and this letter, as we close this section on spiritual warfare, there's so much more that you could probably say, but I wanna, I wanna share with you a quote from Pastor Eugene Peterson. And I think it encapsulates Paul's letter. And it reminds you of, if you remember nothing else, Today, I want you to remember this. There's a God who stands beside you in the fight. There's a God who upholds you in the fight. And this is what he says to you. God loves you. God is on your side. He is coming after you. And he is relentless. God is coming after you. God is on your side. He is relentless. That is good news, church. Let's pray. Well, Father, we do thank you that you have indeed loved us, that you have not given us a fight that is too great for us, that you have not given us something that we cannot handle on our own, but that in your power and your strength and in the glory of Jesus, we can stand and we can fight. Lord, we thank you that this book has taught us how much you have loved us and that because you have loved us, would you help us to be a church that loves people well? Would Marco Island and Naples and wherever else we call home and wherever we spread abroad, would, they, would you use us to point people to the truth and goodness and beauty of Jesus? We ask all of this in Christ's name.